Good evening. My name is Kurt Hoffman, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our first event of the year under the academic theme, Climate Justice, Climate Action. I will begin by acknowledging that we are holding this event on the traditional Cayuse, Sumatilla, and Walla Walla homelands. We pay our respect to tribal leaders, both past and present, and extend our respect to all indigenous people today. Tonight, in particular, we honor their stewardship of the land and the ecosystems uh, for many generations. I hope we use this gathering as an opportunity to reconsider how we will continue their legacy of sustainable living on this land. A few housekeeping issues. Uh, audience members, please keep your masks on during the presentation. We will have microphones to pass around for our audience members who have questions after the presentation. For people joining the event on Zoom, I will be monitoring the Q&A feed when we reach the end of Camilla's presentation, so please type your questions there. I need to thank President Bolton, the Politics Department, and the Environmental Studies Department for the financial support of this event. The academic theme this year highlights action as a key organizing framework. Last year, we enjoyed many thought-provoking lectures and panel discussions on the issues of climate change and climate justice. However, we did not have many chances to help students motivated by newfound knowledge to take action. This year, we are focusing many theme events on ways people inside and outside the Whitman community have been agents of change. As many of you know, a major driving force in the climate movement in the past decade has come from young activists, with many of them being from communities of color. A major component of this year's theme will be a four-part youth speaker series organized by a student committee led by Bertine Lockjohn. At each of these events, there will be three presenters, including one Whitman student, one regional youth activist, and one interna international youth activist. We anticipate these events to inspire the Whitman community to consider how to move from knowledge to action. As the idea of taking action on climate issues galvanized within the planning committee, I recalled email conversations with Camilla Thorndike about her work as a legislative assistant to Bernie Sanders during the fall of 2021, developing the Build Back Better proposal that eventually failed to pass the Senate. I am now glad that we were unable to find time then for a Zoom webinar, as we would be hard pressed to find a better person to lead off this year's theme events and in person, no less. Camilla has been impacting organizations on behalf of our climate since she graduated from Whitman in 2010 with a degree in environmental studies, humanities. She completed a master's of public administration at Harvard Kennedy School in 2020. I will skip a detailed bio as Camilla's presentation tonight titled, The Fight for US Climate Policy from Student to the Senate will take us from her days of activism at Whitman College to the end of her position in the Sanders Senate office as a legislative assistant. Remarkably, just days after leaving the Sanders office, her work became part of the Inflation Reduction Act, recently signed into law by President Biden. Please join me in welcoming Camilla Thorndike back to Whitman. Right. Hello. <laughs> Look at this no mask privilege I get to have. Um, let me just make sure I've got everything set up here. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, Kurt, for all the work you did to bring me here. And thank you all for coming out. Um, and hello to everyone on Zoom. Uh, it was so fun to be at the brew pub last night with uh, Elio and Claire and Callie and um, lunch today with Frazier and Owen and Will. And uh, we eat in the fancy new dining hall by the fancy new sand volleyball courts. Um, so way to level up around here. Um, but I'm also very glad to see that the stick statue remains with its silly hat. So shout out to everyone, anyone who did the Lego action there. Um, so my name's Camila Thorndike. Um, as Kurt said, I graduated here in 2010. And I've been in politics and climate activism all my life. Um, I'm here to tell you that we can do big things and the time to do them is right now. I say this fresh off of serving in the US Senate where I had the honor of helping pass the largest set of climate investments in US history. 
The Inflation Reduction Act means $370 billion for clean energy, electrification, environmental justice, efficiency, tribes, adaptation, farms, forests, and more. Over four times as large an investment as any previous climate bill in US history. And because of our razor thin majority of votes in the Senate, the act does include compromises that allow fossil fuel extraction to continue harming some vulnerable communities. But the act radically transformed the power, transforms the power of fossil fuels competitor, electrified, efficient and affordable clean energy for all. This victory was 13 years in the making. So it feels like a perfect time to be here with you all because of that academic theme that you reckoned with climate injustice last year. And this year you're thinking of how to take action. We know that is crucial because climate change is not some far off threat. It's happening right here and now. It's the smoke you can taste on your tongue. It's the Walla Walla sweet onions literally blistering and melting under heat domes. It's farm workers in those fields suffering even more along with prisoners down the road at the penitentiary who are in solitary confinement with no air conditioning. It was 102 degrees here a few days ago. And over the coming decades, Walla Walla will experience the most extreme heat rise in the state. There will be dozens more days like that every year and hotter. For some people that might sound nice, but for the people working the vineyards of the wine some of you may be illegally drinking tonight, it's not. I learned from my time at Whitman that it's incumbent on me to fight for a better future for myself and for everyone with less than I have. And maybe you think it's too late. So I wanna say this real loud for the people in the back. It's not too late and it will never be too late to do the right thing, but we sure don't have a minute to waste. As Governor Jay Inslee of this great state said, we're the first generation to feel the sting of climate change and we are the last generation who can do something about it. We all have our own climate journey and I'm going to tell you about mine. I promise it's ultimately a happy one or more importantly, one of finding meaning in life through fighting to protect everyone I love. My climate action story started here at Whitman, but my climate worry started <laughs> much earlier. I was 15 years old when I first matched that famous hockey graph stick, or st hockey stick graph of skyrocketing pollution and temperature along my own future lifetime. And doing that overlap, as some of you might have done, made me feel bleak as hell about the future. But at Whitman, I discovered the best way to cope, that action is the antidote to anxiety. It did take me a minute to get the hang of things though, because to be honest, I was a little underwhelmed when I first got to campus. I thought college would be buzzing with activism, but the place felt weirdly quiet. It was 2006 and I'd finished a gap year getting to know my extended family all around the world. In Australia, my cousins gave me a scuba diving trip on the Great Barrier Reef for my 18th birthday. On one side of the boat was a rainbow of coral colors and fish. And on the other side, it was a bleach white ghost forest. After Australia, I spent time with my grandmother in Chile. Every day she was sad that the rains didn't come how they used to. Every year, the snow line crept higher and higher up the Andes outside her apartment window. So when I got here to Whitman, I was ready for scenes like I'd seen from the 60s, protest marches in the streets and burning our bras right there on Ankeny Field. So at first it felt like, man, maybe I was born into the wrong decade. Um, but soon enough, I did find my people. They were just a little camouflaged. Instead of wearing bell bottoms and fringe vests, they were in pearl snap flannel button ups and ultimate frisbee tights and trucker hats. The way I found my people was by asking who wanted to throw down for big change. I didn't want to just worry about a scary future. I wanted to do something about it. And I knew that meant being part of a team. No one can do this work alone, let alone succeed in making any progress. So I wonder what it's like for all of you here today. Do you feel like there's enough action happening on campus or in the community or in our country on the things that really matter? If you feel at all like I did when I was a freshman, wondering if anyone was gonna stick their neck out, here's the thing. They might just be waiting for someone to take initiative. It's a little like dating. Someone needs to make the first move, right? 
And if you take initiative, you'll find out people are more than what you see on the surface. And they might just be waiting for someone to ask. That person should be you. You don't know what kind of community and team you can build around your shared vision and purpose until you try. When I started asking who else was having nightmares about a climate wrecked future, I found my people and I'll tell you about them in a minute. And when we started asking other people to do big things with us, they also said yes. That's how a movement grows powerful. So after settling in on campus, I learned who witties are. We came here with a purpose and to be of service. And witties make exceptional organizers because you are nice, smart, and fun. Turns out that chill ultimate Frisbee vibe is actually a superpower in the fight for climate justice. The reason is that organizers power movements by attracting people's energy. Organizers then pool that energy into functional teams and they lead teams to confront and leapfrog the status quo. And if there's any physics nerds in the audience, um, energy, as we know, is neither created nor destroyed. It just moves around. When you're building a movement, your job is to attract the finite energy that people are spending on one thing to, into your cause instead. And you witties can excel at this. You're nice, so people wanna be around, we, around you. And you're smart, so you're good at solving problems. And you're fun, which is like oxygen to a movement. Anger against injustice is a necessary spark, but our flames will flicker out without the necessary oxygen of joy and love. The student leaders that I met here freshman year taught me these lessons on organizing. And I wonder if you'll recognize people you know in these stories as well. I learned from Juliana Williams, whose ultimate Frisbee skills were exceeded only by her climate brain power. I watched how she co-founded a student climate network across the Pacific Northwest. I watched how she started mastering finance and economics to convince Whitman's treasurer to purchase renewable energy. Juliana is now a specialist in energy markets at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I learned from Katie King, who taught me how to lead the Campus Climate Challenge Club that Juliana had started. Katie always sent meeting notes, uh, agendas out in advance and followed up with notes. And because she communicated how much she respected people's time, they kept coming back. Katie went on to work in Angola, in Sweden, and in Portugal as an environmental consultant and entrepreneur in the circular economy. And I learned from Lisa Curtis, who wrote for the Whitman Wire and went to sustainable development conferences all around the world. She taught me how to write a good pitch and how to work around the clock. After serving in the Peace Corps, Lisa started a company called Cooley Cooley that uses climate smart plants to help low-income farmers pull themselves out of poverty. I spent plenty of Saturdays and late nights organizing with friends like Juliana, Katie, and Lisa. We teamed up with the frats to host barbecues of local food on Ankeny Field, where we got other students to make calls to Congress demanding a more sustainable farm bill. We joined local activists pushing for better transit in Walla Walla and teamed up with them to defeat a coal plant at Wallula Gap. By fighting for big things, we unknowingly were carrying on the legacy of, I think, the greatest witty of all time. William O. Douglas graduated in 1920 and went on to become a champion of civil liberties through 36 years on the Supreme Court. O. Douglas knew big things were possible and he didn't wait to fight for them. And in some other ways, his life is also familiar. He was from around here in Yakima. As a kid, he contracted polio one of the public health crises of his time. And he recovered from polio by doing what witties love best, exercising a lot by adventuring outdoors. As a Supreme Court Justice, O'Douglas's decisions were critical to FDR's New Deal, to the modern environmental movement, and to establishing the constitutional right to privacy from which women, women run the, the right to choose in Roe versus Wade. His fights are our fights still, because the work of progressive movements never ends. It's not a bad thing or a sad thing, it's just that society isn't something permanent or solid. Through our actions or inaction, each of us is writing the rules every single day. And the world we get is the one we fight for. They say well-behaved women rarely make history. Well, I was not well-behaved here at Whitman College. 
At graduation, President Bridges called me his gadfly, but this gadfly got invited back to speak to you all. <laughs> so I hope you will be a gadfly to the people in charge now. Because right now you are actually at the peak of a kind of power needed for big change in the world. You have less to lose and more to gain than perhaps at any other point in your life. This freedom means that you have the power to tell the truth, the power to push authorities, and the power to take big risks. And this matters because getting big things done is inherently risky. You don't always win. In fact, most of the time, you don't. <laughs> Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley said that if you haven't lost any big fights, you're not fighting enough of them. It's okay to fail because that's how we test and push the limits of what we're capable of. Failing is how we learn. In the late 2000s, the climate movement lost one of the biggest fights of all. So I'm going to tell you a story of defeat, but it's also a story of how the energy of our movement dispersed into new forms that would score important wins along the way and come together a decade later to win US climate policy. And before that, I'm going to take a sip of water. In 2009, I was a junior leading the Climate Action Club. It had grown to be the largest and most popular group on campus. Every week we held meetings on the second floor of the Reed Campus Center in that big glass room and sometimes it was so packed that people were sitting on the tables, on the floor, and crowding outside the door. It's because we were out to do big things, and we knew that we couldn't wait. In 2008, President Obama had been elected, and Democrats controlled the presidency, the House, and the Senate. A trifecta like this happens only once every 14 years or so. So the pressure was on. Climate was on the agenda and a carbon cap bill card called Waxman-Markey, named after two senators who led it, um, Senator and Representative, was moving through Congress. A dozen of us witties flew to DC in a snowstorm to lobby for this bill. We joined 12,000 other student activists from across the country. We all wore green hard hats for the millions of jobs that it promised. We mobbed the marble halls of Congress to lobby our lawmakers, and at night, we partied at the convention center. The Roots held a concert and it felt like we could have powered the whole capital from the energy of our bodies dancing on the floor. Renewable energy was everywhere, just waiting to be tapped. In June of 2009, the bill passed the House, but it died in the Senate after Senator Ted Kennedy passed away, his seat flipped red, and we lost our filibuster-proof majority in the Senate. And just like this year, Zero Republicans did the right thing. I'll never forget when Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma gave a speech with a snowball on the Senate floor to claim that global warming wasn't real. Now I hear that birds aren't real. That December, President Obama went empty handed to the UN Climate Summit in Copenhagen and our movement felt crushed. It was awful. As an activist and someone who cared, it felt like the world was ending. As a young person, it was genuinely hard to make sense of my future. Back on campus, my friend Elena and I couldn't stop crying. She invited me to bike into the wheat fields so we could scream our lungs out. Our generation had been told this was the last best chance on climate change. But it turns out there's no last chance. <laughs> there's just the next best chance. And that's the chance I'm asking you all to take tonight. Looking back on the loss of that bill, it's clear how our organizing was not for nothing. We all built power learning how to fight for climate action on and off campus. Then we channeled the energy of the movement into critical new directions, each of us finding our own path to building that better world. Woody's kept doing big things. My friend Will Lawrence fought in this fight. He found his new fight starting a student network for fossil fuel divestment along with other Woody's. This volunteer network became the foundation of the Sunrise Movement. In 2018, Sunrise teamed up with AOC to occupy Speaker Pelosi's office and launched the era of the Green New Deal. And later that year, Whitman finally divested from fossil fuels, thanks to more than seven years of student campaigns. My friend Natalie Popovich also fought in this fight. 
and she found her new fight becoming a PhD expert in environmental economics. Now she's shaping the future of low carbon transportation and energy equity for the Biden administration, working on exciting things like battery powered trains, advising the White House, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Transportation. My friend Robin Lewis also fought in this fight, and she found her new fight protecting our public lands. She now works at the National Park Service, where she's helping our parks, wilderness areas, and ecosystems manage the pressures of climate change. So you get the picture. Even after the failure of federal climate policy in 2009, the energy of our movement was not destroyed. It just dispersed. For my part, I spent the decade after Waxman Markey fighting for policy and electoral wins across the country. I've been drawn to where there's urgency, opportunity, and the chance to win scalable policy change. After graduation, I got to work in Tucson, Arizona for a federal agency that resolves environmental conflicts. We helped the government and community work things out instead of duking it out in court. In the next role, I fell even more in love with the power of facilitation and collaboration. I helped lead a land use planning process where we invited over 10,000 residents of greater Tucson to shape city and county development plans. People got the chance to speak up for what they wanted, which was walkable neighborly communities instead of more sprawl. And that's how we offset the entrenched power of housing developers and car dealerships. It was through collaborative and inclusive public policy making. And I sure wish that all governance worked this way. But throughout those years in Arizona, my heart kept coming back to, to climate policy because the saguaros, the roadrunners, and the Tucsonense people of the beautiful Sonoran Desert would wither in unbearable heat and drought if we didn't make a national transition to clean energy. So while Republicans were still blocking energy at the, uh, action at the federal level, I took my fight to the states, which are the laboratories of democracy. Back home in Southern Oregon, I teamed up with friends from high school to lobby our state legislature for climate po policy. And the way that we built power was through huge collaborative art projects that brought hundreds of new people into the movement. Our first big art project was assembled in a parking lot in industrial conservative Medford, Oregon. It was a beautiful 120 foot long mosaic of a salmon. The salmon was built from individual cardboard pieces that 1300 Southern Oregonians had decorated with their love of home and their desire for climate action. Then we swam that swim salmon upstream to the Capitol in Salem and had hundreds of meetings with, law with lawmakers lobbying for climate policy. Some of those lawmakers still have the decorated pieces of cardboard from the salmon mosaic in their offices today. Soon our little group started getting calls from organizers around the country. They wanted to know how we were getting young people involved directly in climate policy making. So we expanded nationwide into a nonprofit called Our Climate, which is still supporting young climate leaders in more than a dozen states. It's exhilarating to do these big things and so rewarding to pursue a life of public service. But it can also be scary, it can be hard, and it can be absolutely gutting. When we were launching Our Climate, I spent a year all around Oregon to meet and mobilize people. I organized nonstop from the road. In fact, my old office is parked outside on the street. <laughs> I slept on friends' couches and I kept a suit in the back seat. When I walked into the Capitol in Salem every week of the legislative session, my heart was racing and my palms were sweaty. I didn't know what I was doing, but I had to play it cool. In the Capitol, I registered as a lobbyist, pushed lawmakers to introduce our bills, and worked with my amazing team to pack committee hearing rooms with hundreds of constituents demanding action. And let me take a little detour here to share a dirty little secret about politics on the left. You know what the hardest part of all that was? I was not getting punched in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the fossil fuel industry. Those big guys, they operate in the shadows and uh, don't mess with ragtag groups like ours. The political terrain where I really cut my teeth was in turf wars with big green groups. One night before a big committee hearing, I stayed up way too late, shadow boxing over email with their, those supposed allies. It was about a, the speaking order for a committee hearing, who was gonna give which testimony, something like that. 
um, silly in retrospect, um, but early the next day, I had to drive to Salem for the hearing and I was so tired that I nearly fell asleep on the road. That day, I realized that I could have just died a very stupid death. It opened my eyes to the pervasive problem of infighting on the left. Sometimes when we're holding a world of hurt, but the enemy feels too far away, we end up punching the people next to us. And our opponents absolutely love that. Sun Tzu's art of war tells warriors to divide and conquer enemy forces. It's literally one of the oldest rules in the book and it works. In the 1960s, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover had his agents infiltrate the black power movement to divide and conquer from within. And much more recently, the fossil fuel industry blasted fake environmental justice ads against this year's Inflation Reduction Act to divide and conquer progressive members of Congress. So when a new executive director took the helm of my organization and I went off to start a new campaign, the first thing I did was hire a facilitator to build unbreachable unity within our coalition. It was 2016 and I'd moved to the District of Columbia to lead a local carbon tax campaign that would give the money raised back to people. This was exciting but pretty fraught terrain because coalitions on the left were at war with each other here in Washington state and in Oregon over what kind of carbon tax design was best. So the first thing I did when I got to DC was encourage our team to take a step back. I remembered the political miracles I'd seen facilitators pull off in Arizona. So we brought one on to secure, help secure buy-in from all the diverse interests in our coalition. That meant we ended up slightly changing our preferred policy, but that was a very low price to pay for unity. A little bit of compromise can go a long way. From this foundation of trust, our coalition of more than 100 organizations wrote out the inevitable turbulence of any legislative campaign. And after a few years of nonstop work, we passed the strongest subnational climate bill in the United States. The bill that passed wasn't the one that we had set out to pass, but it was still incredibly exciting. It requires utilities in DC to provide 100% renewable electricity by 2032, which is the fastest timeline of any jurisdiction in the country. There were also groundbreaking energy efficiency standards for buildings and much more. This law is now working to clean up the grid, cut down on energy waste and build political power away from fossil fuels. After the DC council cast their final vote on this bill, I sat down on the bench in the hallway full of cheering advocates who were hugging each other. I felt punch drunk with happiness and with relief. My boss, Mike, turned to me and he said, remember this moment, Camila, we don't get too many like it. But I'm here to tell you that if we work together with care and trust, we can do big things. And the time to do them is right now. We can and we must create so many more of those happy moments. In 2020, our movements elected a president more focused on climate than any before. This happened because activists pushed the issue into a prominent role in the presidential debates, including a first ever mention of environmental justice. When Trump made it, tried to make this a problem, when Biden said we need to transition off of fossil fuels, Biden just leaned right into it. Activists had changed our politics so significantly that along with healthcare, climate change was a top issue for Democratic voters. Once Biden was in office and we secured a Democratic majority in the Senate, all that climate organizing was indispensable to passing the first major bill by the skin of our teeth. These tectonic shifts in energy policy and politics happened because people knew we had to do big things and they didn't wait to do them. Because let's be real, the last six years haven't allowed any of us to pretend like it'll all just work out in the end. Ever since Trump won the Electoral College in 2016, it's become crystal clear how the health of our climate and the health of our democracy are inherently intertwined. While in office, Trump repealed more than 100 environmental rules that keep our air, water, health, climate, and kids safe from corporate pollution. And for this and many, many other reasons, 
Americans rose up to vote him out in 2020. My friends and family across the country spent months making calls to undecided voters from the pandemic proof living rooms we were all in. When the election finally wrapped up, there were parades of people honking, dancing in the streets of DC. My friends and I packed into Black Lives Matter Plaza right by the White House. There were rainbow flags everywhere. And I even saw a secret service agent dancing by the doors of the treasury. And then the runoff election started for the two Senate seats in Georgia. This was so important because if we won them both, Democrats would hold the majority in the Senate. Georgians always knew they could make this happen and that there was no time to wait. Getting to organize down there with the Sunrise Movement was one of the biggest honors of my life. On the morning of January 6th, the last votes were coming in from DeKalb County, where I had supported a powerhouse crew of uh, high school activists who had docked, knocked hundreds of doors. And when the race was finally called, we ugly cried happy tears and did cartwheels along the, around the room. Warnock and Ossoff had won, the first black senator and the first Jewish senator from the state of Georgia. Now that we had the narrowest of democratic majorities in the Senate, it was finally game on again for climate policy. But of course, January 6th was also a day of spine cracking whiplash, or as Van Jones called it, white lash. Hours after the Georgia victories, we watched in horror as Trump and his cronies unleashed a violent mob of white supremacist insurrectionists on the most sacred place of our democracy. The insurrectionists desecrated elected officials' offices. They attacked the police. They wanted to kill public servants over the big lie of a stolen election. So I texted my friends on the hill in a panic. Were they home safe? Was anyone I loved hiding under their desks as a violent mob battered their office doors? Trump supporters I knew said it was just a peaceful protest. Later, of course, it came out that these protesters wanted to hang Mike Pence and that Trump wanted them all to have guns in the Capitol. We have experienced collective political trauma in this country. And just like the global climate injustice, the people who've engineered the least structural violence are the ones most targeted by it. We need to do big things together now, and we can, but we have to be real about the threats facing climate action and the democratic rule of law. Because as you all are well aware, fascism is rising in America. Trump hasn't faced any real accountability. His MAGA movement has taken over the Republican party. They're issuing death threats against local elected officials. They're still lying on Fox News and they're rigging the rules at the highest level. Keep an eye out for a pending case from the Supreme Court called Moore versus Harper, which could allow partisan state officials to overturn the will of the voters just like Trump was bullying them to do last election. The crises of our democracy and of our climate are products of a rigged and broken system. These crises will continue unless we change the fundamentals of governance here in America. And I say this because for years, for the life of me, I could not figure out how we were not getting anywhere on climate despite such strong majorities of public support. But the grip of minority rule is as old as the United States. What democracy we have in America was fought for by the people excluded from it from the start. Black people, women, Native Americans, workers, immigrants, poor people, even kids. What democracy we lack in America is kept by that way by corporations who fight any laws between them and unlimited profits whether it's protection for workers, the environment or fair elections. What democracy we lack in America is kept that way by people who wish that only cis, white, straight Christian guys with money were still in charge. That's what they mean by make America great again. We face four interrelated structural problems that are important to track. Gerrymandering, the electoral college, the makeup of the Supreme Court and the Senate. We need to care about these structural problems if we want to keep fighting for climate justice. So let's start with gerrymandering. 
Republican governors and state houses are drawing district maps to ensure that white conservatives control Congress. People of color have driven most or all population growth in battleground states like Texas, Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina. But extreme partisan gerrymandering dilutes their voting power. And thanks to the Supreme Court, there's no longer federal oversight to check this blatant racism. Another structural problem that's long blocked climate action is the Electoral College. It's how candidates take the White House even after they lose the popular vote. The Electoral College was created to give slaveholding states an outsized role in choosing the president, and it has perpetuated white supremacy ever since. It's clear how this is connected to climate breakdown if we imagine that Al Gore had been president instead of Bush and we'd taken climate action 22 years ago. Maybe one third of Pakistanis wouldn't be flooded out of their homes right now. So the Electoral College sucks. It's also responsible for our far right majority in the Supreme Court because Gorsuch, Kavanaugh and Coney Barrett were nominated by presidents who lost the popular vote and confirmed by a Senate of uh, confirmed by senators representing a minority of Americans. And as you know, the extremists on the court are slashing democratic norms from separation of church and state to a woman's right to choose to the ability of agencies like the FDA and the EPA to keep us safe from pollution. Back in 2010, when I was a senior here, the court ruled on a big case that allowed fossil fuel and other corporate money to buy politicians without any transparency or limits. The day of the Citizens United decision, my professor said, well, kids, today's the day your democracy died. Before Citizens United, John McCain and five other Republicans in the Senate had actually voted for climate policy. That has not happened since. The last major structural block against climate justice and action in our system of governance is the Senate itself. The way it's structured, allows Americans in conservative, wider, older, rural states to have up to 70 times more voting representation in the Senate than Americans in liberal, multiracial, populist states. You can think about how many people live in Wyoming versus California. Both states get two senators. This means that overall, Democratic senators represent nearly 40 million more voters than Republican senators even though the Senate is currently 50-50. And without reform, this gap is going to get worse because of the widening population difference between large states and small states. By 2040, about 70% of Americans will be represented by only 30 of 100 senators, while the other 30% of older, wider, more conservative Americans will be represented by 70 senators. This means that to win even a bare Senate majority, Democrats have to win much more than 50% of the vote. And if the fundamentals of the Senate were crazy enough, then it's got these nonsense rules on top of it. And the worst is the filibuster. Who's heard of the filibuster? Show of hands, great, it's popular. Uh, this rule allows the minority party to veto the majority will of voters. You need 60 out of 100 senators to get around the filibuster. And it's why we had to pass climate policy through this bizarre thing called budget reconciliation, which allows us to pass laws with only 50 votes, but has to be inherently budgetary in nature. And you know what the filibuster is mainly used for? Overwhelmingly, the filibuster has been used to block civil rights, voting rights, women's rights, gun control, and climate action. Without the filibuster, this year the Senate might have restored the civil rights movement voting law that the Supreme Court gutted in 2013. And more democracy from more people being able to vote would mean that future Senates might not be constrained by a 50th vote like Joe Manchin, who drove us all insane blocking the Build Back Better Act and nearly killed all federal climate action. But in the end, against all odds, he didn't because activists and insiders never stopped fighting, not in the offices and marble halls of Congress, not out in the streets or in boardrooms or on Zoom. With barriers to democracy blocking so many important priorities, how did we get to the point where federal climate policy was again a possibility and then actually passed? Let's zoom out just for a minute. 
My friend Will, who I mentioned earlier, describes the decade starting in 2010 as the millennial movement decade. That decade started with the Waxman-Markey bill dying in the Senate. The first half of the decade was marked by outpourings in the street of young people learning to flex their power. Occupy Wall Street, the Dreamers, Black Lives Matter. Climate and justice organizers were leading divestment campaigns and fighting fossil fuel infrastructure around the country. Native Americans, ranchers, and environmentalists came together to defeat the Keystone XL pipeline, which would have carried tar sands from Alberta to the Gulf of Mexico. Community organizers and green groups came together to shut down over 350 coal plants nationwide. Indigenous people came together from around the world for a months long encampment at Standing Rock to resist the Dakota Access oil pipeline. In the second half of the decade, this momentum funneled into the political arena with the rise of Bernie in 2016 and the congressional elections of AOC and the squad in 2018. Youth climate organizers channeled the energy of the divestment and fossil fuel infrastructure fights into launching the Sunrise Movement. Their mission is to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process. So they recruited an army of young people and unleashed those 18 year olds on politicians who got pretty freaked out because they realized climate could be the issue that they won or lost their elections on. And it was good that activists aimed really high with their demands because you, what you get is usually much less than what you ask for. Bernie's presidential campaign called for a $16 trillion Green New Deal. And going big gave Biden the space to call for $10 trillion. By the time I got to Bernie's Senate office early last year, the budget committee he chairs was negotiating over $6 trillion for a sweeping set of social infrastructure policies along with climate action. This was called the Build Back Better Act. What ultimately passed the budget committee was a $3.5 trillion package. You see how it keeps going down. Then the whole House of Representatives passed a $2.2 trillion package. And this brings us to the Inflation Reduction Act, a $740 billion deal that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer managed to cut with a coal baron. It's $370 billion for climate is the largest such investment in US history. But I have to say how painful it was to see billionaires and thousands of corporate lobbyists kill the rest of Build Back Better. We lost paid family leave, universal pre-K, dental hearing and vision coverage, affordable housing, debt relief to black farmers, the civilian climate corps, e-bikes, and much more. We need to keep fighting for this vision of America. But how did we end up with anything at all, let alone climate investments that will help avoid nearly 4,000 premature deaths and create 9 million jobs by 2030? The answer is that determined congressional staffers and advocates just never quit. A small organization of Governor Inslee's former policy team called Evergreen Action, you should look them up, um, helped le lead the way. And Whitman can be very proud of 2017 grad Danny Hupper, who led Ev Evergreen's action on the Hill. Heroes like Danny and hundreds more fought like hell to get this big thing done. They knew they couldn't wait because the climate couldn't wait another dozen years for a federal policy window to open back up. Activists protested outside of Manchin's yacht in DC and at his coal plant in West Virginia. Organizers took over the congressional baseball game. Congressional staff even staged an unprecedented sit-in at Majority Leader Schumer's office. From last summer until passage this July, or sorry, August, <laughs> Senator Manchin killed prospects for climate action many times over through long delays and dramatic announcements, including one on Fox News just a couple days before Christmas. <sighs> so this last time, Leader Schumer went to the press and said Manchin was out, that there'd be no bill. The response that unleashed was a fire hose of pent up rage from outside and inside the building. Almost all of us had thought that it was game over. Our hearts had broken again with the PTSD from the Waxman Markey days, only worse because we felt we were truly out of time. But Manchin was taken aback by the world no longer handling his precious vote with kid gloves. So just days later, he came back in secret to the negotiating table. 
No one but Schumer's top staff was involved because the situation was so delicate. When the deal for the Inflation Reduction Act was announced, it shocked everyone. Not even other senators knew that it had been in the works. And although we all wanted a more transparent and democratic process in the end, to be honest, it's a little impressive to keep such a big secret in the most gossipy town in the country. Manchin, of course, is DC's top recipient of fossil fuel dollars. So the bill gives some painful favors to the industry, especially oil and gas leasing in the Gulf and in Alaska. And it proposed the approval for the Mountain Valley fracked gas pipeline through West Virginia. But without climate activists, the Sunrise Youth Movement and the organizing behind Bernie's successes in the Iowa and New Hampshire primaries, the $370 billion in overwhelmingly good climate spending simply would not have happened. Pressure from the outside gave progressives on the inside the power to demand climate as the number one priority in the landmark bill that Biden just signed. And to round out tonight's story time, I want to tell you of some of the amazing things this bill will do. It's going to build out the clean energy supply chain right here in America. It's going to create and re-onshore millions of good green jobs. It's going to save Americans up to $1,000 every year in energy costs. So how's it gonna do these things? There's a lot, but I'm not gonna keep you here all night with the 750 pages. The act extends and expands clean energy tax credits, which are the workhorse driver of decarbonization. The credits for wind, solar, geothermal, energy storage, and other technologies are designed to incentivize good paying jobs with union benefits and to explicitly benefit low income, disadvantaged and legacy energy communities. Nonprofits, schools and governments can now better access these tax credits through a provision called direct pay, which is like a cash grant instead of having to rely on Wall Street to take on the tax liability. This means big new benefits for tribal communities and hard hit territories like Puerto Rico. And overall, these clean energy incentives could more than triple US clean power production, which would drive retirements of fossil fuel power plants and reduce air pollutants, including in fence line communities. And what's awesome is that the Inflation Reduction Act is already working as we're seeing clean energy companies announce new factories across the Midwest, Southeast, and the Southwest in just the last month. The bill also massively expands the Department of Energy's loan guarantee program. It helps rural electric co-ops retire coal plants, and it helps new transmission lines get renewable electricity to cities. The bill strengthens the EPA's ability to cut pollution in the power sector and reinstates the super fund tax on fossil fuels that fuels the agency's cleanup of contaminated sites. The bill cuts emissions in the excuse me, transportation sector by cleaning up ports, which are usually cited in communities of color, low-income communities, and indigenous communities. The bill provides new funding for EVs and especially helpful provisions for commercial fleets government fleets like the post service and heavy duty vehicles. The bill provides rebates and tax credits for households to go electric with efficient heat pumps, induction stoves, breaker box upgrades and more. Getting fossil fuels out of our homes and buildings is huge for climate progress. And it's one of the areas I'm most excited about. It'll also be huge for helping Americans with rising costs. Under the act, a household making $50,000 a year, which is about 75% of median income, will be eligible for up to $14,000 in home electrification incentives. If you go electric, you break free from the wild ride of fossil fuel prices, which are the leading driver of inflation. There's so much more in this bill. There's more than $47 billion for environmental justice. There's money for clean manufacturing and industrial decarbonization decarbonization, which is critical because industrial emissions are the only source of climate uh, pollution which are projected to rise over time. There's funding for conservation and agriculture, for urban forests, and for coastal resilience. There's good labor standards, funding for coal miners suffering from black lung disease, and lots of money for state and local climate action. And if the bill works as we hope it does, we might even break the partisan logjam on climate action. As, climate, as clean energy jobs start growing in Republican districts. The Inflation Reduction Act has set the stage for all the work we need to do now. 
and we can't wait to do that work. There are three areas of work that we need to push for, and I hope that you all will be involved in that. The first is implementation. We need to get money to communities as quickly and equitably as possible, to those hit first and worst by the climate crisis, black, brown, indigenous, and poor communities who have borne the brunt of pollution. We need to get the money out the door to build the clean energy economy. And the second bucket of work that we need is state and local action. The money in this act will help leading states like Washington go further faster and make their existing climate policies even more effective. For example, the bill's clean energy tax credits make Washington's renewable portfolio standard of 100% by 2045 easier and cheaper to achieve. But all states need to go further and faster and it's incumbent on us to push them. The third area of work is aggressive executive action. Biden did a great job passing this bill, but he needs to go further with the powers that he can use on his own. He should use existing Clean Air Act authorities to rein in pollution. He should go further on electric vehicles. He should order the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to work on how we are going to build transmission for clean energy across this country. And he should order the Securities and Exchange Commission to disclose fossil fuel risks and costs to our financial system. He should stop the Willow Project in the Western Alaskan Natural, National Petroleum Reserve, which would be the largest extraction site on our public lands. Biden's job is not done, and neither is ours. There's much more we can and need to do to engage in an all of government approach on climate, to create millions of good jobs, and to secure a safe and just future for every single person in this country. There's so much we need to do to protect our threatened democracy from permanent minority rule. And you can start making this happen right here and right now as students. You can hold Whitman accountable to its sustainability plans. You can help get out the vote for the critical elections this November so that we can maintain control of the House and the Senate. And by talking to your friends and family about why social and social change and politics are important, you can change what the people around you are doing with their time and engage their energy into the movements that we need to win. Whitman grad and Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas said, and I quote, I do not know of any salvation for society except through eccentrics, misfits, dissenters, people who protest. Listen to Whitman's best. We need it. Please join me in taking action now and for every single day that we're here on this beautiful earth. Thank you. All right, uh, so we will um, have Q&A now, time for to answer your questions. And we're here until uh, 8.30. So we have plenty of time to answer questions if you want. Obviously you don't have to stay, but if you're uh, interested and wanna um, present a question, please uh, think about that and raise your hands and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, I do have a question on the Q&A on, um, online, on Zoom. So this is from uh, Paul Rommel. It was an honor sharing the stage with you at PSU's Fortified in 2014. So this is um, you have uh, continued to do very well to spread the message. I've been working in renewable power for 18 years and echo your message that must continue to start now. It's never too late to start. Uh, so congratulations on your work. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> so that's not really a question, but uh, anyway. Uh, so uh, yeah, we have a question over here. I'll leave one on this side and you'll just start throwing this around. Hi, um, so in your speech, you mentioned um, like the barriers to achieving like climate justice and like the like gerrymandering, the filibuster, the electoral college. And those are all like systemic issues that are like ingrained into the constitution of our country. I was just wondering like, how you like where do you start to address those issues that seem so big and out of our control mm -hmm. and how do you find hope to like continue your work 
when those issues seem so big? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think that the structural problems in our democracy are as big uh, as the kind of how you wrap your head around the climate crisis itself. So maybe I'm used to, you know, tilting at windmills, but um, I think honestly, it, it starts with education. And that's why with your time at Whitman, the more you can learn about the history of how our government works and why these systems were set up the way they were, then you're prepared with the knowledge that you can drop at any moment. You never know when that moment might come. It's a conversation you know, with your uncle. It's the chance to write an op-ed. It's maybe at some time you'll be in front of a lawmaker and you can you know, make a case for why democracy reform bills are really important. Um, and to be honest, I, I didn't really learn about the, the deeper structural issues in, in our, our government until grad school when I took a class called um, U.S. History for Policymakers, Activists, and Citizens. You know, I had some of the, the basics, but our public education system is set up so that we stay ignorant about, you know, the roots of so many of these just bizarre, arcane rules and, and systems. And that's because there are powerful interests that want to keep us in the dark. And by learning and becoming conversant in what's really going on and why it's so hard to get good things done, um, you become a much more you know, powerful agent of change than you might realize. And then you know, the number one piece of advice that I always give is just to join an organization because our civil society is what um, prevents our country from slipping to the kind of, you know, darkest end of the spectrum that we might go. It, it was because people in organized groups were ready to make phone calls and turn out the vote and knock on doors and educate their neighbors and have hard conversations with families um, that we managed to prevent Trump from taking a, a second term. Um, and, you know, you need to start joining organizations and giving your energy and time to them so that they're more effective when the moment comes to either pass a big bill to, to make progress on these issues. And we, we came really close. There, was, there were democracy reform bills that were introduced this year. And um, because Senators Manchin and Cinema didn't want to reform the filibuster, those bills failed. But it takes years to develop a good bill, years and years and years. Um, so when the policy windows open, we have to have done all the work up front to make sure that we can seize them. And now's, now's the time to start. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hi, thanks so much for this. I first have to beg your pardon because I think I'm gonna take about 12 students from this space um, to a class on environmental writing. And because you mentioned the salmon art, I would just love to hear your ideas about the role of art and literature in this um, organizing and change making. Yeah, yay. Um, I think it's so vital um, because climate change is a problem of the imagination, right? We, we can't imagine, or maybe our parents couldn't imagine how bad it was gonna get. Um, and we can't really imagine how good it could be if we were to make the changes that we're called to do. Um, and so art as the expression and the portal of imagination is vital to getting people who are just going about the kind of daily life of paying bills and driving to the supermarket and you know filing your taxes or whatever you're doing to actually step out into a space of like, well, what if? Like, what if our world were different in these beautiful ways? And what if I felt the way that I do when I hear this you know, piece of music or look at this beautiful painting or engage with a piece of sculpture? Like, what if we actually built the, a, a daily life and a culture of engagement that, was, I can't help but say it, it was beautiful. I think that's that's what I feel my work as a climate activist is, is it's a form of art. Social engagement is a form of art and it, and it brings people in to ask them to express themselves um, and to share something that you've made about why you care about whatever issue you're passionate about. And that's what we found with the Big Salmon was that you know we couldn't just do like a traditional protest not in a very politically purple area where, you know, maybe five people would show up and they'd call us dirty hippies and that would be that. But if we did 
an art project where we could get school groups, you know, church groups, um, mom's book clubs, uh, you know, any number of, of, organ of spaces where people already gather. We invited those groups to decorate the tiles and then bring them to that parking lot in Medford on a Saturday in February. And the experience of seeing how our energy in a material way came in to create something so much bigger than each of us individually, and that that salmon was so stunning, um, that created a collective right off the bat. And to create a collective is the beginning of creating a movement that can actually pass policy or do whatever it is that you seek to achieve. <laughs> no question. Hi, Camila. Thank you so much for your amazing talk. Um, I have a question uh, about this relationship between you being active as an activist and you working also in the circuits of politics. Like, how was your process of dealing with those commitments, or like, you know, those um, expectations of pragmatism when you are on the on the table negotiating with real people, with real politicians that have a whole like group of people behind their backs, and you know you're not gonna get everything that you have on your agenda. And then when you get what you get at the end, how do you deal with that? You know, how do you deal with those emotions? Also, how would you set, how how would you, would you um, speak to uh, young activists that very often feel very disappointed because of like, you know, the things that we get, um, uh, how to uh, work through uh, through those things that we get and through and, and how we can keep hope and don't lose that hope hmm. in acting. It sounds like you've had some experience in this. Is there a specific case that you have in mind? Uh, I'm just thinking about uh, what you were mentioning here in the United States, but also like, um, given that I think one part of your family is from Chile, yet yesterday mm. there was a big, uh, you know, uh, the constitution that was written um, by the Constituent Assembly in Chile was uh, rejected by the population. Uh, and now you see the left again, you know, being very critical and kind of like fighting against each other. And uh, so mm -hmm. how, how to deal with that and how to keep energy to keep fighting. Um, yeah, gosh, it's yeah, that's real. <laughs> uh, my my mom's from Chile, and we have a family text thread with my uncle and aunt who are there. And there was so much hope and so much excitement about this new constitution because the old one was put there by a dictator, Pinochet, who had been supported by the CIA <laughs> in America to overthrow a democratically elected socialist president. And so over many, many decades, the constitution that Pinochet put in place had privatized water and um, destroyed the public education system and you know countless issues that have really dramatically changed the country. And people had resisted, rose up right over many, many uh, student uprisings, uprisings of people who were tired of increasing you know, transit fares, like things would spark these mass moments that then led to um, a, a referendum for a new constitution. And, you know, I, I haven't read enough about the analysis on, on why it failed, but when it went to the people for a vote, it did go down by, it was over 61% or something that, that said no. And I think you'd, you'd say some people were afraid of change that seemed so drastic, right? Such a big shift, um, that alone, no matter whether it's for something good in this case, or at least from my perspective, change is scary um, to people. And I take hope that all the work that went into that process, just like all the fights that I fought and the people who've kept going and picked up the lessons from defeat um, and not given up, it will lead to a better Chile. Like it, it's going to manifest. Um, but here's where like strategy comes in because, you know, to, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again with this you know, expectation of different results. Like you at some point need to look at what has failed and diagnose the reasons for its failure and design your next moves based on hitting that target, right? And um, an example of on, on the bill, what I worked on and think was most directly responsible for was a provision that passed in the House version, but it didn't make it into the Senate version. 
and it was to allow direct pay, which is the cash grant option for tax credits for households. So no matter who you are, um, we were fighting so that you could get rooftop solar um, without having to have enough, it's called tax liability. Like you have to earn enough to have taxes to offset, right? And if you don't earn enough, you don't have tax liability. So you're not getting this benefit from the government. So it ends up being a really inequitable situation. So we wanted direct pay cash grants for solar on, on households. And so to answer your question, like how do you, how do you decide what to fight on and what do you do after loss? This was one area where I knew I could fight on this because my boss cared more about solar than anything in, in the package. So I could get sign off. And then I knew that nobody else was doing it. Um, and thinking about, you know, what's your value add? Like who else, what space do you wanna fill that's not being filled? Um, that's where I saw we could actually get something done. And we ended up getting more than half of the Democratic caucus in the Senate to sign a letter petitioning the <laughs> Finance Committee and Leader Schumer to include this provision in the bill. And they did. And it went over to, you know, in the House version, it passed. What Joe Manchin did with it is another story. But after that provision and dozens, I mean, dozens, like hundreds of pages worth of incredible legislation died because Joe Manchin didn't want it to happen. And I think what helped us all was to understand why, right? There's, when you're on the inside versus the outside, the, the hard limits of vote counts become very real. Like it's, it's as physical as a desk, like you, you can't add an extra senator after the elections are done, right? And that's why elections are so important. Um, but but because we understood that the vote margin was so slim that any, getting anything done would be kind of a miracle in the end. Um, and that if we were wanted a bigger majority in the Senate so we could pass what we really wanted, we would have to work for it. Like we all have to go back out and we have to campaign and we have to fight disinformation and we have to turn out the vote. Um, and if you can understand the reasons why you can't get something that you want to get done, it makes it more palpable. And then if you have community, you can hug and cry it out together and pick yourselves up and keep going. <laughs> yeah, Fraser, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, hold on. Oh, sorry. Let me get you a box. I love these new question over here for speakers. Um, just, just quickly, my name is Kirsten Nicolason. Thank you, Camila, for coming to talk. Uh, I'm going to say that in my role as a private citizen here, I am active in three different community groups. Actually, one is now defunct because we had a Sunrise chapter mm. here in Walla Walla until the start of COVID. However, if you would like to do some of the organizing that Camila is talking about, I am meeting with students at 4 p.m. tomorrow outside of Cleveland Commons and you are all welcome. There will be phone banking that starts at 5 p.m. tomorrow and door knocking every weekend and I can hook you up. Um, so happy uh, to follow up on these suggestions. <laughs> That's awesome. 4 p.m. tomorrow outside of Cleveland. Do it. <laughs> um, thank you, Camila, so much for your lovely presentation. And I'm curious, this may be daunting to you, but where do you think you will apply your energy next? I'm curious, you clearly have like big visions, um, love to hear where you would like to go. And, and it sounds like direct pay to homeowners is a real big deal. Um, is there any way that can be brought back? Uh, thanks for the question. I, um, I don't know about bringing direct pay back. I, I actually think that there are much bigger deals than that even. It was the thing that I could do in my position. So I really dug in, um, but I am in the, well, I've just finished interviewing for a couple different um, positions that will allow me to keep advocating for federal policy change. And in particular, the implementation of all the billions that we just passed, because um, I want to learn about how the bill that is just really now a bunch of words on paper will turn into real things in real people's lives. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to be part of an implementation process of something that I've worked on. And a lot of people will tell you it's you know harder and more important than the fight to, to even get a bill passed because public attention tends to dissipate and the status quo kind of entrenched power actors know how to work the system and they have their people hired and they can be there every day kind of 
manipulating the rulemaking process for for a bill to actually again deliver those benefits. So I'll be working on implementation. I'll be very excited to share exactly how at some point. Um, and I hope that you and I stay in touch after our conversation, um, working on getting Fraser to commit to lifelong activism because <laughs> he's really good at it, clearly. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Okay. Who else? Here. I, I have to catch up with my uh, questions from the Q&A. So, um, let's see. Were there, um, this is a question from Andrew Carter. Were there any thoughts given to adaptation measures in either the Build Back Better plan or the Inflation Reduction Act as a way to help adjust to help adjust to the climate, the changing climate, or even as a safeguard in case current mitigation efforts don't have the desired effects? Yes, um, there is money for adaptation in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, there was more in Build Back Better. Um, this isn't something that I've worked on in depth, so I can't speak to the details, but I'd be glad to follow up um, with that person and, and provide some information. I do know that you know there's funding for like coastal communities that are dealing with sea level rise, for instance. Um, there's funding for uh, the EPA to better monitor air pollution, which is you know important from everything from smoke to uh, the kind of criteria air pollutants that fence line communities deal with and then can help fight right through court battles or legislation or whatever it might be. Um, and then there's a bunch of money for grid infrastructure and resilience also, because basically the whole theory of decarbonizing is to get our electricity to be powered from renewables because it's easier to replace electricity with renewables than it is to have liquid fuels like gas and diesel and jet fuel um, to be renewable. People are working on that and there's some alternatives, but the, the strategy is to clean up the grid and then to power our lives through electricity <laughs> instead of, right, like through EVs, induction cook stoves, heat pumps, electric heat, uh, clothes dryers, um, all, all of these things that rely on the grid working and us having enough renewables. And so I think that's gonna be a major challenge for and an opportunity for adaptation going forward. And there's there's some money for that. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question here, and uh, similar to a question asked earlier in the room, but what advice would you give to people new to the climate policy space who are seeking to make an impact on the issue starting at the local or regional level? And what advice would you give to young people in particular who are aspiring to become future climate policymakers at any level? Great. Well, I would say connect with, was it Kristen? Kirsten. Connect with Kirsten. <laughs> um, when I was here, I got to work with a lot of amazing local activists. And, you know, those were the campaigns where I learned the most in many ways, um, because you know, the, the beautiful thing about a college campus is that you get to take space away from the rest of the world to really dive deep into whatever academic pursuit you're, you're following, but it's really important to keep a foot in the, the world that everybody else is living in still, and especially in a time like this, to be engaged in the midterm elections is what I'd say is the most impactful thing you can do um, for climate action right now. And there are Lots of local campaigns. In fact, I had a list down there. I can I can even connect you to friends who are working on political action committees um, and are supporting candidates from the local level on up because we're building a bench of climate leaders. And that starts with who are you electing to city council or county commissioner who then can go on to become a state lawmaker who then is drafted to run for Congress and maybe to be you know secretary of the interior or go on to be the president. Sometimes people leapfrog, but a lot of times it's about building the kind of experience and connection to the issues um, and the people who are pushing you in a certain direction that, that deepens um, a bench of talent that you know Democrats and left-leaning independents need to keep uh, climate going and that the Republican party should be building um, on climate action. So seeing how much we can mobilize, move our elected officials at the local level, um, it really also matters. And then seeing what, I don't know what kind of ballot initiatives or campaigns are going on in Walla Walla um, right now, but the first thing I would do is just go talk to somebody who's already doing it and see how you can be helpful. 
Great. Um, I have one, I guess one, it's kind of a question, but an observation related to this conversation is that before the um, pandemic, we and we had to shut campus down for a semester, really marked the end of the climate campus climate coalition, which is an organization on campus for students, particularly who are interested in this topic. Um, so, and I imagine there are other kind of similar organizations that probably didn't survive through that transition. So what do students who are interested in this kind of issue, where do they go? Um, uh, and I know that Frazier works with the ASWAC Sustainability Committee. Is that the right title? Mm -hmm. So there's one option, but it, but if they're interested in having some organization like that, that's kind of separate. Um, did you start an organization here or were you kind of brought into an existing organization? And how does that work from the, from your, your reflections as a student? Sure, yeah. Well, from what I've gathered from talking to you all in the last 24 hours, um, there there is a real difference in campus life now than when I was here uh, because of the pandemic, like you just said, this kind of break in space and time where you're actually at a pretty exciting moment of getting to decide sort of whole cloth what, what you want to do. And I, what I've heard is that uh, the land back movement and the issues of um, Palestinian uh, Israeli conflict is are two of the more active kind of conversations on campus. And I'll say at least for land back and indigenous sovereignty, I mean, that is right there with, with climate action, right? Because again, who is hit first and worst and what would it look like if more of our land and ecosystems and economies were led um, by indigenous people through uh, practices and values that are integrated into the land. Um, so it sounds like there's really wonderful things that are going on, but what's, what's different is that in years past and actually very recently, like the Sunrise Movement is going through a transition period and um, its chapters aren't as active right now. I understand that they will be coming back with a new kind of call to action and strategy. And it's worth getting in on the ground floor of that, like see, see what they're doing, see if you can revive the chapter here um, because the Campus Climate Challenge, which I joined um, and led but didn't start was a national call to action from organizers that were setting up chapters all around the country. And from those chapters, then we had a collective kind of groundswell to go lobby Congress for the Waxman-Markey bill. And so in the absence of a national kind of infrastructure right now on, on climate, if that is indeed the case, I'd say like, just think in a, in a local and a regional way right now and, and connect with the groups. I don't know, Kirsten, if there's like an indivisible chapter here or, um, Great. <laughs> That's awesome. So there's about six organizations that uh, Kirsten just rattled off and I'd say, you know, joining one, but then as students, do it with your friends, like pick someone, right, to, to come with you to meetings. Um, I just don't think that this work is best done alone. And when you have someone with you that you enjoy or getting to know, and you can bounce ideas off of each other, you can say, hey, how did that meeting go? And, and it's important to kind of learn in whatever form that is. Vocally, you could keep a blog, um, talk to the professors here who've seen you know, many iterations of student activism over the years. Um, but above all, just, just try it, just go for it. And you, know, the, uh, you really do have so much power as students. And I don't think that often, like my peers at least didn't realize that. Um, that and at lunch today, Amy Molitor said like, you students have more power than I do um, <laughs> because you're the, you're the clients of this place, right? Like you are the ones keeping 
Whitman a thing. Without you, there is no Whitman. Um, so like use this opportunity, like go for it, fail hard. You're still going to graduate college. There aren't like hardcore consequences. The only one that you should be worried about is regretting not going for it when you had the chance. <laughs> Great. Well, that sounds Anything like else? a good send off. Okay. Any. Um, <laughs> if there are any other questions. Um, Don Snow is not going to grill me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that you ask. <laughs> You've uh, dropped some names tonight. and Your talk has been very political and direct, and I really appreciate that. You're not pussyfooting. I want you to address a threat beyond Trump. Trump is a, uh, he's a click magnet and a kind of a jokester. Uh, he has a peculiar genius at just simply calling attention to himself the center of his own cyclone, right? But he's also pushing 80 years old. And Trump is not, you know, Trump is a symptom. He's not a cause. Mm -hmm. He's a recent manifestation of something very old. So name a few other names. Who do you fear beyond Trump? I'm serious. Yeah, you're, I know you are. Been, you've been in Washington. You've been in the Senate. You've been in Bernie's workshop. Who do you fear? I mean, who really turns your blood cold? Ron DeSantis? Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. And why? Well, there's a pattern of failed states where a buffoon will topple, try to topple a democratic government. And then the smart people are watching what he or she, but mainly always he, um, does right and where he messes up. And then the next opportunity, they've got a much sharper game plan and that's when they win. And DeSantis, who's governor of Florida, is I think that person who is extremely well positioned um, and has been experimenting at the state level for now years, right? This is where there's like the don't say gay law, uh, draconian bans on uh, transgender kids and their families, um, the overturning of uh, felons right to vote that was now years ago. I mean, nitpick the issue that's on the fascist playbook and Florida's trying it out. Um, and so I, th I think that someone like that is, is the greatest threat. Um, I mean, Tucker Carlson on, on Fox is another, uh, to watch, right? Like, these guys are silver spoon Ivy elites who masquerade as these populist, you know, champions of the people and through the oldest <laughs> sleight of hand in American politics, they pretend to be the everyday person, right? Like Bush changed his accent so that he could resonate with the regular guy. Um, Trump was a, he's a Manhattan billionaire for God's sake. Like, People like Carlson and DeSantis are going to do this chameleon trick where they pretend that they have, you know, they have all these grievances that the elites on the blue coast states have uh, taken away their rights, taken away their money, taken away everything that, you know, people genuinely might miss. And that's, that's what Bernie has always tried to champion is uh, what is driving the the American voter to a fascist candidate. And the reason that he fought so hard for the social benefits and build back better was that a democracy that's making a real difference in people's lives is a one that can sustain itself because voters see that, wow, now I have money in my pockets. I have a roof over my head. I have health care. <laughs> um, you know, that all of these very important fundamentals um, our, our government needs to deliver on still. And we've made some strides, but in the absence of that, there's gonna be a huge kind of disaffected populace that is prey to people like Trump and DeSantis. Um, and they do their thing through scapegoating. Like, oh, you 
you feel like America's left you behind, that you're forgotten in a flyover state, well, it's because of the Mexicans, right? It's because of women who can earn so much that they don't need a husband anymore. They, you know, whatever it is, pick the grievance. They'll they'll point it at someone else instead of the conservative party's you know agenda, which is like just funnel money to corporations, let corporations do whatever they want. Um, which of course harms everyday people um, more than anyone else. But that's not the narrative that those everyday people hear. And Bernie was one of the only people in with enough of a platform who was connecting the dots there. And that's why there was a Obama uh, Trump overlap or there's the Bernie Trump overlap, right? In voters um, in 2016, where you would not have a, an Obama Trump overlap in voters. And it was because the, you could take that populist disaffection and rage and turn it in a progressive direction, or you could turn it in a fascist direction. And that's why going back to just being involved in politics, like maybe that next person is you or someone you know, or a candidate who's working at the local level who can be the voice for good um, for people who feel like they've been left out. <laughs> Thank you. Right. <laughs> well, thank you, Camila, for staying so long. And uh, I appreciate, again, your, your message today and your um, answering our questions. So um, thank you. And everybody have a nice evening. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>